Hello. Today we are going to make shrunken heads out of apples. I have two victims here with me. This is Calder and Josie, who are going to have a go at making shrunken heads. Um, the Americans make these and make um, make granny dolls out of them. As you can see, the apple dries. We carve it and it dries and it makes wrinkled little old person faces. And then they, they make a body for it with, uh, with wire and rags. And this is the head and they put hair on it and it makes a cute little doll. But because we're coming up to Halloween, I think shrunken heads are much more fun. And to be honest, most of the children I know would go for a shrunken head rather than, rather than a rag doll type thing. So today is shrunken heads. Do you fancy making a shrunken head? Yes. Okay. Go for that. Yeah. So, once we've made them, we hang them up on a piece of string in the airing cupboard or over a boiler, somewhere warm and fairly airy, so they've got time to dry out. And if we make them today, they'll be ready for next Halloween. So it takes a few months for them to get nice and wrinkly. So the first thing you need to do is choose your apple. And we've got a wet selection here. These are Charles Ross's. These are from my tree at home. And they're actually dual purpose apples, so you can eat them all cooked with them. So choose one. We have to soak them afterwards in lemon juice and salt. So I don't want one bigger than will go in this pot, please. Okay. Yeah. This one, yeah. Thank you very much. Are you ready? Right. And I'll make another one too. And then next year I'll have a fresher one again. <coughs> Arm yourself with a nice apple peel. Thank you. And the first thing you have to do is peel our apples. Now, if you peel your apple with all the peel coming off in one long strip, and you're an unmarried person, so that's you and me out, but Josie, you can try it. Then you get your peel in its one strip and you throw it over your left shoulder. And it lands on the floor in the initial of the person you will marry. It's funny, they'll begin with S or J. Yeah, it's funny. Um, you, know, you never get anything with, with K. No. You know, everybody called Kevin or Carl would be unmarried. Mm. So I don't think really no, that's good. Anyway, right. peel your apple and do more your fingers. Okay. Are we, am I not going to put it in one piece? Are we supposed to be putting the peel in there? Yeah, just do it off the table and put it in the bucket afterwards. I can't remember which one I'm going to use. Hmm. I've actually peeled that apple before. I should have got you peeling the potatoes as long as you get used to it. <laughs> The Americans have a wonderful I way of like using eggs. apple peels. <laughs> um, they make what they describe as apple chips, which looks like crisps. Um, it's basically sugar them and dry them out in the oven, and they make a taste of a snack. <clears throat> so if you've got an eating apple that you're using, rather than these that are a bit sharp, you can do something with the peel afterwards. Um, if not, it just goes in the compost heap. Usually, of course, I'd be doing this with the sort of full-on apple day thing, so we'd have um, apple preserves to try, apple jelly and spiced apple jelly and apple chutneys and different variety of apples to, to try. So, um, we can't do that today, but we've got a lovely sheet of apple recipes, and if anybody wants to um, send, in, send, send email me and ask for it, We've got several fat sheets available. There's one about orchards, there's one with apple recipes, and I can send those out to you. So if you email kathp at shropshirewildlifetrust.org.uk, I can send those to you. And the one for giving something to use your apple peel for will be on it. Now, once you've got your apple peeled, you're ready to decide which side of it's going to be the face. So apples aren't regular, most of them aren't perfectly round. So have a look at it and decide where its face is going to be. So it's sort of vaguely a head shape. And then we have to start modelling it into a face. And remember, everywhere you cut a groove in it, it's going to shrink and the groove will be emphasised. 
So make your mouth and eyes and nose and ears and things so that when they dry out, they're going to really stand out. And we've got some lovely clothes to pop in for his eyes, which makes it look kind of even more shrunk and hairish. So do we want to do them bigger or smaller than we actually want them to do? Like, do you need bigger than they're going to be? Do, do them fairly big. Yeah, exactly. Exaggerated is, is good. Okay. So I'm going to just... Oh, I don't want to see what she's doing. I'm Sorry. going to dig out a couple of nice holes for his eyes, because then they'll shrink around it and make it look all sort of shriveled in. Remember that when they made proper shrunken heads in, in, in the Amazon, they, the, the eyes were usually replaced with, with shells or something, because obviously the eyes don't preserve very well at all. What did they do with the skulls, Kath, um, in the, the Amazon, when they were doing this to actual Well, they had to take the skull out because it couldn't really shrink, the, the, the skull couldn't shrink. So what we did was skin the head, um, having sort of unstitched it at the back somewhere it wouldn't show too much, and then stuffed it with hot sand so, so that it, it, it dries out naturally. It was a, na a natural mummification process. So if you want to mummify anybody, you need somewhere really nice and dry. You, you get natural mummies occurring in sort of caves in the desert and things where a body's been left. And it, it, it used to be sort of quite normal for bodies not to be buried and they would be left in a cave or something to dry out naturally. Mm -hmm. And then the skin turns into a sort of parchment and obviously they've left all the bones in so it's... it's keeps a bit of shape. Yeah, keeps shape. <laughs> so here we are, I'm going to poke my clothes in. Make sure you don't poke them too hard on the end or the, or the round bit falls off. So that's when we're starting off with a very basic face that's just two clothes stuck in the holes for his eyes. Excellent. Lovely. Let's see your faces. I mean your apple faces. <laughs> and then you can really go to town carving wrinkles and lines and, 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 a, and a, a good nice nose for him. I like the nose on the one you did over there, that was really cute. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, you've got to decide whether you're going to be cute or ghoulish. Really? Yeah, but that, I'm, I'm going to decide that one, don't I? Yeah, see what it turns out like. <laughs> Mostly they turn out pretty ghoulish. I always found out when I was doing this as a, as a family event that little boys made them that were so oh. ultra scary it was untrue. And little girls made nice smiley ones. It's not true that thing about boys and girls being exactly the same. Mm. We used to do, for Halloween, we used to do uh, bats on sticks, so a black paper bat, and you could honestly, you coloured it in and then put it on a stick so you could flap it and the little girls always made nice smiley bats with sort of pink bits and things and the little boys made ones with sort of terror eyes and blood dripping and all the rest so <laughs> it, it's surprising without any instruction at all they don't always uh, that's what they go for we've got a nose out, we've got a hole <laughs> It doesn't really matter. I mean, don't forget, it's, it's going to shrink like that, it's going to crimp like that. It was a spell that would have a hole where the nose was. It would, exactly. So. And that'll be particularly ghoulish then. That's just right for Halloween. Yeah, that'll be right. That's why I did it. Well done. <laughs> we know, really. Once you've got them and they've dried out, of course, you can keep them forever, really. So you can keep them as Halloween decorations. And then. Josie is 25 and, and coming with her new husband or whatever, you can embarrass her by getting them out and going, this is what Josie made when she was 12. Yeah. And they don't smell? Nope. You get a pleasant sort of apple smell with a touch of clove to it. Because um, you think rotten food in your house is a bit ropey. It don't, they don't rot, they dry. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, if you that smell that quite nice. I did, yes. That smells it's quite got, nice. It's, it's like, a bit like a pomander. It's got the fruit and the, and the, and the clovey smell going on. It doesn't, it doesn't actually smell like something decaying at all. No, it's perfectly fine, isn't it? You could also bury a load in a mausoleum and then in 3,000 years' time some archaeologists will, will dig them up. And uh, okay. it must have had ritual significance. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> mummification of apples. Right. 
Note from being an archaeologist that anything you can't explain has ritual significance. <laughs> There's going to be shrunken heads all over your garden. Oh, it's going to be full of me. The best thing is, of course, if you've got your own apple tree, you've always got some to spare, you know, and it, and it, and it, and it saves, saves money going out and buying them. Yes, yeah. I don't know if he'd be smiling if he's had his head shrunk, so perhaps I should change that mouth shape. No, I wouldn't worry about it. Maybe he was very happy to have a shrunken head. <laughs> oh, I've got a tuss If you're doing this for very young children, and you don't think the sharp knife is a good option, um, you can carve your apple quite nicely with something like a bamboo skewer. Um, it makes equally good indentations, uh, just to take a little bit of scratching the apple debris away. But uh, it's, it's good to have people who old enough to have a sharp knife. We were going to give one to Josie, but we thought maybe Kelda shouldn't have one. But no, We've been very nice and given everybody a shot back. Mm. How's your carving gone? Are you, uh, are you happy with your carving? Oh, yeah. oh, I like huge eyebrows. Yeah. I like, I like the mouth on yours, that's good. Mm. Yeah, I like yours, it's really good. There we are. Now, so if you're happy with all your cut, that's as much carving as you want to do, yeah. we'll go on to the next stage. And for this, I'd like you to tie a fairly long piece of string, or thread, onto the stalk of your apple, so you can hang it up to dry. Oh, I can nearly break my stalk off. I have oh, it at no. the end. If, you, if, if, if your stalk isn't good enough, you can stick them on a pole instead. I might have to. Um, <laughs> They do equally well. This one's dried, stuck on cotton. Yeah, on the I might have to do that. Look. So you can, it's you can use that instead. So that it's like a loop, like that, or just like that. Um, what I'm just doing is it. just tie it one end of it in a knot. Then you can make a loop in the other end and hang it up in your area. Oh, that would be quite good, wouldn't it? But if you put it on a pole, you'll have to put it in a jam jar or something. Okay. But it works just as well. Don't worry. Um, while you're doing that, I'll make the um, the marinade for them. Mm. Obviously, you know when you peel an apple and leave it, you get that sort of nasty brown thing going on. And you don't want them to go rotten. So what we're going to do is we're going to put enough lemon juice to cover the apple. I'll buy nice cheap lemon juice because Really, if you end up juicing lemons for this, it gets terribly expensive. And probably takes quite a while. And takes it. And you end up with a lot of lemon peel, but you're thinking, well, I ought to do something with that. So, because we've got three apples, I'm going to use quite a lot of lemon juice here. Yeah. Once you've got them in the lemon juice, they need to stay in there for about half an hour before you take them out and dry them and hang them up. The other thing that goes in the marinade <coughs> is some salt, and this also helps to preserve them. So, about a tablespoonful of salt per wrapper. Ready to shrink. 
if we were in Papua New Guinea or somewhere, we'd be very proud of ourselves. So what, why would people shrink heads in those tribes? Or would, would that be shrinking the heads of their enemies? Um, it could be either enemies or ancestors. Um, basically, anybody, it, 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 it's a sign of respect. You're not doing it to make fun of your enemy or your ancestor. You're doing it to say, um, we respect you. You were an important person and we want you to keep, to keep you with us. So, um, yes, respect rather than so I thought it'd be anything else. else. No, no. Um, it's a bit like sort of you know, the, like a trophy, the you know. cannibalism thing. Mm -hmm. It was never to do with disgracing the person. It was more to do with um, taking in part of them into yourself. Oh, so it's respect more than anything else. So, all we need is something a bit heavy, just to, oh, this will be for work, is it? I think this will, this will work if we just shut the lid on, it'll hold them down. So, those will sit for half an hour or so, until they've taken on enough lemon juice and salt to preserve them. While they're doing that, though, we can have a bit more of a chat about apples. Did you know, you know when you go to the supermarket these days and your choice of apples, you've got cooking apples and then you've got maybe a Brayburn, a uh, Royal Galway uh, and what else, Pink Lady, something like that. Yeah, yeah. You don't get very much choice of apples, do you? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, and they all taste the same. They tend all to be juicy, crisp, sweet. Yeah. That's what you're going, going for. Started off in the 70s when they started importing those wretched gold deliciouses. And they called them the crunch. And they were supposed to be the very last word. Before then, the most popular apple was the Cox's Orange Pippin, which of course is a homegrown apple. If you get a golden delicious that's grown in France and it's ripened on the tree properly, it's a completely different beast. It doesn't taste anything like a supermarket one. They're, they're really nice. <coughs> But because all the apples that we get out of season now have had to travel such a long way, they've been picked under ripe, they've been ripened in controlled circumstances, they've been freighted over, so they're not in best condition. In Victorian times, there were over 200 varieties of apple specific to the British Isles. Just in this country? Just in this country. And the big orchards in, um, in, in, in the grand houses and things had enough varieties that they could have apples that they picked themselves from August with the very earliest ones and ones that they could store and improve the storage so they keep their own apples right from August until about June the next year. Right. And they have special slotted shelves in a special storehouse for apples. Must have smelled wonderful when you went in there. And they set the apples out so they didn't touch each other, and so they, they would keep. And it'd be dark, pretty much. It'd be dark, um, but quite airy. You don't want to be no air. Creatures come in. Um, you probably have to put some mouse traps down. I always find when I try and store apples, they do get eaten by the mice oh, quite badly. Okay. I do always keep some, but I'm not very conscientious about it. Like They're not ones I want to eat myself. I keep them so that when the really hard weather comes in, I can throw them out on the lawn for the field fairs and red wings and blackbirds. Well, the hedgehogs, are they hold them? Don't be asleep by them. Oh, of course. <laughs> yes, yeah. No, hedgehogs are totally um, insectivorous. All that stuff about them collecting apples on their spines to carry for storage is a load of rubbish. They only eat beetles and slugs and things. So, no, they don't want to eat apples. Because there are some bite marks in our apples mm. on the floor. The floor the, the there'll be mice. Right, okay. Mice right. and squirrels will take them. Right, okay. So, if you come over here, I can show you some different varieties of apples. I'll get rid of the apple peels first. Um, here we've got all sorts of lovely apples. These are, these are British varieties. Okay. So, these ones are Charles Ross. Um, they're a dual purpose apple. They're, there aren't very many purely cooking apples. You could, 
do nothing with but cook brownies perhaps. These ones, you can, if you want quite a sharp apple, you can eat, or you can cook it with a little sugar, and they, they mush down nicely. Right. They make rather nice, nice trees as well. They, they, these ones are a bit, uh, haven't ripened as well as they might have done, they usually get quite a nice red blush on them. These ones are Jupiter, which would be more to your taste, they're a sweeter one, and uh, lovely coloured peel. Like red, yeah. Um, these ones would be very good for making the, uh, the apple chips that we were talking about yes. earlier. Yeah, that would be quite good. I fancy having a go at that. You'll have to send to me yeah, and get the recipe yeah, yeah, please. These ones are Egremont russets. And if you have a feel of that, if it, it hasn't got the smoothness, no. it mm. hasn't got the, the, the shine that a lot of apples do. So that's called russeting. In an apple, that roughness is, is russeting. These are rather a nutty flavour. They're not terribly sweet. They keep well, and the flavour improves with keeping. What else have we got? These are red pippins. Did you say pippin has pippin. Pippin something? Yeah, pippin is a seedling. Right, okay. So uh, you get trees called brownie seedling, and you get trees called red pippin. It just means it's a seedling. Basically, it's a tree that somebody is it's grown naturally from, a, from an apple pit, and this is what's happened. If you grow an apple tree out of a pit, it's never going to grow into the same tree as the pit came from. So if I grow a tree out of the pit of my Charles Ross, it's not going to grow Charles Ross. Because oh. the apple in my garden, the Charles Ross, will have been pollinated by crab apples, we have crab apple trees, um, we have uh, brownie trees, our next door neighbour's got a, a red pippin. Um, so there will be a whole variety of apple trees in the area. These are visiting and then they'll come in and pollinate the blossom on my Charles Ross. So the tree that grows from the pip will have a bit of all of those trees in it. Or you know, at least two of them. Yeah. Brownies and things actually need three pollinators, they need two pollinators rather than just one, because they're a triploid. These are Cox's pippins, Cox's orange pippins, and they were the ones that used to be the most popular. And they were always, you could tell if they were right because the seeds would rattle and you could hear them. These ones, oh that one's rattling, have a, have a, have a, have a rattle. You always tried out whether they were properly right by giving it a rattle. Uh, they, they were always our favourite apples. Um, last of all, we've got the... These are Red Windsors, and they're another old English breed. Um, the majority of these came from the community orchard in Oswald Street, which is an orchard that was, has been planted to preserve old Shropshire breeds. But some of them came from Aldi's. Uh, they actually have a good selection of British apples. So they're okay. But it's, it's worth going and having a look at some of these local orchards, community orchards, and the orchards at old um, like National Trust properties, Ethel Parks, because we've done this and it's got a good one. So they tend to hold apple days and you can go and look at the different trees. Um, community orchards quite often are fairly recently planted. So there's a couple around, there's one in Wrighton and there's one at Maybe in Telford. And they've been planted in 2000, 2005, this sort of thing, to perpetuate the breeds of apples. These are, these are, these, some of these are like, literally rare breeds. Um, we have a special apple that was discovered by Oswald Street um, on, on the Sweeney Hall estate. It's called the Sweeney non pariah oh, which okay. means that there's a, nothing to compare with it. Um, it grows a really big apple, and the, the, the biggest of them is, is nearly a foot in circumference and weighs over half a pound, just one apple. And that's a, that's not it's a big apple, apple. that's a... It's, it's a, a dual purpose. Dual purpose no. um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good big apple. You assume the bigger they are, they're usually associated with cooking apples. It's not necessarily, not necessarily. But, you know, that, that's one that, that grew from a seedling, and the owner of the hall looked at that and went, oh well, that's some apple. Probably his gardener, actually, rather than him himself. And he sent it down to the Royal Horticultural Society and they said this is a really good variety. To perpetuate the variety after that, you don't grow the seeds, you graft part of the tree onto a different rootstock. Okay. 
So you perpetuate it by vegetative propagation rather than rather than the seed. And that, that means you know you get exactly the same thing again and again. Thing. Um, yeah, I mean, really worth going. I mean, if you can go to some of the old orchards, um, you, you can see why they're so valuable and such a, a benefit to wildlife. Because um, apple trees don't really live very long and they grow, they show signs of ageing really quite early on. So they have what you call an early senescence. Okay. So I think I probably have that as well. But um, <laughs> they, they're particularly good for wildlife because they get covered in, in lichens and the bits rot and you get holes in the trees that the birds like and they grow mistletoe on them, again, the birds like. And there's loads of, I mean, they, they surveyed one of, one of the orchards in Shropshire and found over 200 species of lichen just in that one little orchard. And that doesn't harm for the apples? It doesn't harm the apples at all. Okay. It's just, it, 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 they just like to grow, they need something to grow on, mm. and apple tree is a particularly good thing. And of course the lichens then make a home for all the little bugs and things. Yeah. And that's things for the birds to eat. Um, the rot in the trees, they, they, they have rot, rotting holes in them while the tree's still alive and growing and producing apples quite cheerfully. And you get these bits of rot and then you get beetle larvae in them. There's uh, the noble chafer, I think it is, um, only lives in the rot in fruit trees in orchards. So some of these species if, we, if the orchards go, the species will go. Um, we've lost over 90% of the orchards we used to have in this country. And birds like wrynecks, that used to be particular orchard birds, don't breed here anymore. They're migrant, they go right up to Scandinavia. It's not a climate thing. Um, but they just haven't got the right places for breeding. Mm. There's, there's this tiny woodpecker that can look right back over its shoulder. They're amazing things. These are called snake birds because they do this turning the head round and they hiss when they're not happy. Oh, they're absolutely great. But they love orchards. Yeah. So, yeah, orchards are really, really important for wildlife. It used to be that just about every farm had one, mainly for making cider. Because when you have a load of people in to do your harvesting, um, they needed something to drink and what they liked to drink was cider. And if you didn't have decent cider or didn't have enough cider, they wouldn't go to your farm, they'd go to somebody else's. So it was very important for all the farms to have their own orchard. And they'd have the apple trees and the pear trees for perry as well. Yeah. And then in the hedges, they'd have good big, well grown hedges that would be full of fruit for the birds and things. And also damson trees. You quite often see damson trees in the hedges. Because in the war, they were collected for to make the khaki dye. Oh, really? And you think that a damson would come up with a khaki no, dye, but it doesn't. Um, so, but you know, all the farms around, certainly when I was about your age, actually, all the farms around us, in the hedges, there were, there were damson trees. And they were, they just did it themselves, they grew themselves practically. <clears throat> and it was a cash crop in, in the autumn. So, fabulous things. You know, everybody ought to have an orchard. That's fair two acres of land you've got, all of you. Go and plant some apple trees in it. But if, if you haven't, don't worry, because you can always go and have a look at some of the um, some of the established orchards, the old orchards, like the, the, the ones that uh, the National Trust properties, and the, the community orchards, support them, buy the fruit, buy the cider if they make them, or the apple juice if they make it, and um, just really get out there and enjoy your apples, and try and buy ones that aren't imported from New Zealand because this country used to be absolutely self-sufficient in apples. We're really well known for having a fabulous variety of apples. So try and get some, try and try some. Because I know that they all descended more or less from exactly the same trees. And they all came from Kazakhstan. But they almost self-domesticated them mm. on the Silk Road. People would eat them and the horses would eat them. And then as the uh, waste products moved through them, as it were, um, they would be planted at the side of the road. So, all, you know, different trees would be growing. And people, of course, always selected the juiciest, the brightest, the, you know, the ones that they look like, look off, the biggest ones, the sweetest ones. Even horses pick the sweetest ones. And so, as they 
gradually people, people moved the trees, if you like, along, fit, selecting them for sweetness and size and juiciness. These, these apples spread along the Silk Road into Europe. Before then, our only apple trees were crab apples, which, because they're much sharper, they, they, you can make a very nice apple jelly with them, but you wouldn't want to eat one off the tree. Um, okay, so these have been in their pot, marinating in the um, salt and lemon juice for about half an hour now, and they're ready to come out. That was my one, I think. And what we'll do, we'll just quietly dry them off without, without rubbing them too hard. There we are. And they'll be ready for you to take home and hang up in the airing cupboard. If they're hanging up, of course, they're out of reach of mice. Oh, good, yes. <laughs> um, I guarantee they will dry and shrivel beautifully. And by next year, you'll have some lovely Halloween shrunken heads to hang up. There we are, the majora. Oh, Ready to go. They don't look like they've changed yet, but it'll stop them going brown. That's the important thing. Right, yes, okay. I know they're going to go brown eventually, but it will stop them going brown prematurely and will stop them rotting. So, there we are. A lovely crafty afternoon for you. You can go home and make a whole load more of them. We Let's see what they look like when, when they've been left for a while. So we are going from that to that. And how long does it take to go from that to that? This one's been done about two years. And this very wrinkly little one here, I did about eight years ago. <laughs> so it's been sitting on my window cell ever since. And that was my first apple carving event at the boat house in uh, 2013, I think. So, there we go. So, if you've enjoyed it, everybody out there, I know those of you who've watched this, watched me performing before, are going to be absolutely sick of this. But for those of you who haven't, if you're not a member of the Wildlife Trust already, please join. Very important, it's one thing that keeps us going. Looks after over 40 reserves in the county and wildlife all over the county. Lots of events. Stuff going on for youngsters. Um, obviously, we'll be back to what live events once we've got out of this wretched crisis thing. So, do think about it. As little as five pounds a month for the whole family, and you get a lovely um, joining pack with all sorts of things in it. The other thing is, if you've got an auntie or somebody that perhaps wouldn't like a shrunken head for Christmas, and I can't imagine you would, but. There we are. You can't give anything else to give her. How about a gift membership for Shropshire Wildlife Trust? Um, you get a special, special gift pack ready to give her at Christmas or give to the whole family. You don't have to go out shopping for it. You can keep socially distanced. It's not a problem. And it's an absolutely lovely, lovely thing to get. So have a think about that. Um, either that or you can adopt a piece of wildlife. We have... We have pine marks, uh, we have holly trees, we have barn owls, I think. Dormice. Dormice. All sorts of different species. Go online, hold it, adopt a piece of wildlife as a present for somebody. Um, something to cherish forever. There we go. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>